thanks for thanks for um, thanks for joining me. Um, I, the, uh, I've been wanting to do this uh, conversation for quite some time. Your background in applied mathematics and basketball put, sort of puts you in a sweet spot. Um, you may be unique in the, in the basketball world, right? That you've had. There, there are plenty of data scientists that are employed by NBA teams and other sports uh, franchises, but not many of them played uh, at a high professional or at a high competitive level. So, um, which which came first, the love of mathematics or the love of basketball? Good one. <laughs> um, for the love of basketball. Yeah. Um, no, when I was young, it was a love of mathematics. I have to say, grew up in Cameroon. Um, I started playing actually I was 15 years old, so I did love math before that. <laughs> it was a bit of a geek. Um, I wanted to be a doctor, an engineer, all these things. Um, but I think when I moved to the U.S., um, most because of basketball, really, um, I just kind of like confirmed both, really. So I judged that although I had a very strange and basketball schedule, I was able to maintain, you know, my love for math in front of combined both, so, yeah, um, and I always thought that after basketball, I would do something with math, you know, because that's something that was dear to me, so I'm glad I, I kept Yeah, that's great. I actually, I work in technology, right, and I had a data scientist on my team, and I was trying to get him to think about the story within the numbers and I said if you, if you really want to like have a cool way to play with it with a really fast or, uh, feedback cycle look at basketball because there's a ton of statistics where you're you're gonna get a feedback loop that's really quick some of the stuff we do may take months you know to, to really know whether your your premise or hypothesis is true or not but you're getting New data is repeated two times, uh, up to 95 times um, in, a, in a year. So um, I, I couldn't make him fall in love with basketball. He's not a, not a, not a sports guy. But um, I, I do have a couple of questions around that. So what, what do you think are statistics that, give me one statistic you think is wildly overused, and one that you think maybe people don't know about but can really tell an interesting story about the player. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, why do overuse? I don't know if overuse for the wrong reason. I think the plus minus statistic is of why they overuse. Um, there are always some kinks around it, but I think it's useful to uh, most people. I think every team will look at it. Um, so, not that's necessarily misleading. I think the basic statistics as far as point and rebound are all great, but what analytic we're trying to do is really get deeper in the layer to not just as money score 12 points, that means he's a good player necessarily, or better than somebody else. So I think getting deeper gives us actually more information than just the, the, the normal statistics like everybody said. They're still useful. But that's kind of a good analytics. So maybe in terms of like the normal statistic are widely <laughs> maybe used or misused can be seen in that light. Yeah. Uh, they're still relevant. But I think the advantage of analytics is that we're really trying to drill deeper and trying to kind of like pull out the value of a player, a team, we attach it to financial stuff just so we have a better idea of what we think this particular player is bringing to the team. Um, your second question was on the years. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you think is something that, you know, people, that is a really good sort of um, measurable yeah. that people don't? Um, my guess is like different organization, um, one, one that is probably known, I don't know if it's really on the yield, it's just like shooting free throw. It's a good predictor of, usually when we're trying to project college kids' ability to shoot at a pro level, um, that's one that's pretty reliable, has been. Um, I don't know if it's on the yield, I think maybe it's something that people just think, oh, it's a good free throw shooter. 
they may not necessarily connect it to the fact that you know we use it kind of say if you know at a poor level this particular player will project to be a good shooter or bad shooter. Yeah. So it may be one of those things that's out there but people may not. But I think within the analytic group probably every team they know about it. But the public may not necessarily you know kind of use it. Yeah I think that's a big one for for draft um, draft next college three point shooting is not necessarily as good an indicator as free throw shooting because you're yeah. eliminating a lot of the variables yeah. and a lot of context. You're, you're isolating form, you're isolating rhythm, you're isolating all of those concentration, all of those things. Uh, I think that's what that's about. Going back to rebound, I have a, and I didn't want to use specific players' names, but I've, I've always maintained that Stephen Adams is the best rebounder in the game, not necessarily because of the amount of rebounds he gets amount of rebounds he creates for his teammates in many cases. Was, am, I, am I wildly <laughs> off base there? I mean, are, are there guys that can create team rebounds even if they're not the ones that are actually bringing them in? Um, I haven't particularly studied that to see this, you know, from an extent standpoint, how it works, but as a form of players and, you know, just actually trying to think about it as we're talking about it, yes, I definitely can see that because, um, if you're just like very good at boxing out other people, you know, your team obviously has a higher chance of getting those people as well. Um, also maybe too because he's like, you know, his role, his NBA role as a player is really like, that's one of the big part of his game, rebound, and so he's more conscious about it. Um, so I definitely can see your theory about it. Um, I think another factor is that with the evolution of the game, a lot more teams have gone into not sending as many people to crash the glass like they used to. There's a lot of strategy now involved. Sometimes teams designate who they want to go to the offensive rebound. Go guys and get back guys. Yeah, so it might give me a little bit of advantage, but I think he's a guy who's pro for a long time, you know, that he's a good rebounder. Uh, when I played a little bit in the NBA years ago, um, uh, was it Wallace? What's Wallace's first name? Ben Wallace. Listen to ben Wallace. So they had a statistic about the it was something about the rate of rebound you get per I can't remember either per minute or per something, right? And his number was like like it was like so up, right? You're like number one, like so a guy might have 15 rebound, but he was like it was like it was the definite mistake to see how good a rebound that people are, you know, in terms of having a possession and how often you get it. So um so yeah, I think today, a lot of people sail around, it's made a little easier to rebound because it's not as, you know, people have kind of like, some team that kind of put kind of on the side that yeah. we used to like 10 or 15 years ago. And you have a lot more long rebounds. Um, because of shooting three yeah. point shot and that kind of stuff, yeah. But definitely in your theory, yeah, I can say it. I mean, he's, he's probably the strongest player in the NBA, at least arguably, and I think um, when he played against guys who, at his size, he does a really good job of boxing out, which creates the rebound, you know, for other guys, guards, uh, who can go in front of that stuff. Yeah. So I think we're we're running low on time. I have one last question. It's probably the hardest question. How do you quantify defense? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have the answer to that. You have me go. 30 statistics on basketball uh, reference for offensive metrics. Defense is like, we have steal rate. Yeah. Right. We have blocks. What? What are the? What are the things we don't know that you guys track? Um, I, I can obviously talk specifically about what the Sixers do. Um, and I'm sure you know this year I have not been that much focused or involved into the any group of the Sixers because um, yeah, you know, have not had a good group. Um, but with spatial data, you know, that we have now, the video data, all that stuff. Um. It, it's so great to bring like a different dimension to what that they can capture. So there's a lot of work around that to see, you know, distances, for example, right? Like if a guy's a good defender, is it because he's close enough to his, if the guy who's guarding, is it, you know, when he contests with a shot, was it distance which you're not making a good rebound? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of parsing those data to kind of see you know, what make a guy a good defender? Is it like, we know like some guys are really good because they have a, they take really good position, kind of position defender. 
uh, some might just be some instant athleticism. But what we're trying to do with all this video data is really to spatially understand, you know, how the player position himself, what is with the defender. Um, I don't know that there's a solution out there yet. <laughs> Again, I don't. Um, that's why it makes it very difficult for us when we look at college players to project them from a defensive standpoint. There's a lot of zone, you know, plays which is kind of frust was frustrating for people like me <laughs> who trying to value them. Um, so we're trying to narrow it to looking at the lateral quickness, you know, things like that to have kind of an idea. But from the data standpoint, um, I don't think we're there yet, but definitely it will get there at some point. What, what I noticed going back to last year's uh, next series, I think the big key in that series for me was the ability for the Sixers to sort of route the, the backcourt from the Nets into sort of that low efficiency sort of... Yeah, the long twos. And the the long-ish twos, right? Yeah. And sort of having drop coverage with the turn value at the board and with, with Joel primarily. Uh, and having the guards sort of guide their backcourt into the sort of 18 pull-ups. Um, is that like... Is is that a is that just a coaching technique or is there like a lot of math that goes into it? There is a lot of uh, math that goes into it. Um, I think that's kind of widely known. Like I don't think people don't like long twos. <laughs> we start talking about probability and that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're not going to get fouled as often. In those yeah. Um, so a lot of teams use those strategies. Uh, Houston does it, and I. And, you know, every team kind of do it that way. So we rather give up the long twos. We play to probability with that. Usually, um, if you're able to keep teams mostly to those kind of shot, you have a better chance of winning the game. So there is another funnel into it. The coaches make the strategy based on the recommendation of another team. You know, they take whatever input they want from it. Um, but I think that it's been pretty much widely accepted to the NBA as a lot of teams trying to do it. Now, if you have, like, do you have the players actually who can do it? That's a different story, right? But it's different. And then some games, you know, guys make shot, and it may look like, you know, you guys are foolish for doing it. But, you know, with math, it's always like over time, you know, I start looking at the, the, the people start progressing to the means, you kind of know usually where it tends to go. So, and we, you know, for our team, to me, um, you know, we have great shot blocker as well and all of these guys, so uh, we definitely have, a, have to have some kind of strategy that we feel is a winning strategy, and I think that's what it's in trying to implement with the help of the new team. One last one I'm going to sneak in. Um, dribbles per possession. Dribble per possession. <laughs> is, this a, is this a good indicator for a point guard? Um, someone that uh, may become an inefficient player, or is it, or is it bad? Um, I actually don't know. Um, I have to add, I haven't, last year, I, that's not something I dug into, or that I know that somebody did, I'm sure they may have this year. Um, so I cannot answer that question from that extent. Point. As a scout, <laughs> I can give you my opinion, and I think um, it, it maybe depends. I think in general, you want a guy who doesn't pound the ball too much. Uh, you know, uh, there's some exception. Um, I can think. I don't know if Chris Paul maybe fall into that a little bit, but he's a, a little special. Like you know, the, the way he can run an offense a little bit different than. Most point guard, you know, can get other guy out of rhythm if they do that kind of stuff like that. So, I think in general, um, we like point guard to pass the ball, to get it moving, to have the ball in sync and moving and shooting the ball. Then the pounding the ball, or years ago the Charles Barkley pounding the ball from the three point line, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, all of you are very. I mean, Houston, I guess, is doing some <laughs> regard with James Harden pounding the ball, but. There may be some exception, those guys were like very special, <laughs> you know, and you can get away with it, but... Um, but it's not something you would teach at the, uh, if, no. at the high school? No. I, I, I don't think so. I don't think any coach would teach anyone to, you know, any point that I don't know how to do it. Um, 
yeah, so from an extent point, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure somebody else thought it is so much there. Well, that's a perfect way we'll have you back <laughs> to talk about some things like that. I appreciate you coming. I mean, I'm game. I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah.